To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. Well, welcome back gardeners and homesteaders to this lovely little show we call the Backyard Gardens Podcast. We are here today to talk about seed starting mistakes and we know that we have both made a bunch of them. Or actually, I know I have. Have you, have you, Batavia? Have I gardened? Have I started seeds? Of course, yeah. <laughs> it's only natural to make the mistakes. And you know what's funny? Yeah, yeah. I keep making some of the mistakes year after year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, you know, there it is, people. But this is that time of year where we are going to get you going in the right direction, hopefully, and start an army of seed starting fiends. That's the goal, right? Um, just to make it a little bit easier for everybody, uh, real quick before we get started, please consider joining us on Apple subscriptions or Patreon to help support the show. Amazon link below, all that good stuff. And, um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, you know, there's nothing, no better news than that other than the fact that we're here to talk about gardening. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to approach this one because... I did a video recently about this on Sandy Bottom Homestead YouTube and, you know, I wanted to do it again on here because of the conversation that we can have. And, you know, it's another input point, another data point. Plus, there's a lot more time to talk about it here. But um, Mm -hmm. there's just so many avenues in which you can go wrong with this, you know, just trigger points and decisions that we make that can really turn us down the wrong road with seed starting. Yeah, I think that there's the actual impact of the mistakes and then there's kind of the, you know, the emotional maybe impact of the mistakes, like the, the impact it has on you and and kind of what's going to happen for the rest of the year as a gardener. It can be it, it can be a defeating experience when you you stumble and you make some mistakes. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> <laughs> wow thanks for you know Defeating, a special episode of yeah of uh, backyard gardens podcast where being laughed said batavia i've never felt like you've laughed at me before no i laugh <laughs> because defeating is like the the actual word that describes it the best when you look and i can just envision myself like looking at stuff in the past and even uh recently and just being like man mm-hmm, all that mm-hmm. work all that time and yeah. the thing is it's important to note when we're starting seeds, like some stuff, you, you don't get a lot of leeway. You know, you mm-hmm. don't get a redo, you know, I mean, and we've said this before, but our redo in gardening is the next year, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. multiple yeah. months yeah. down the road. That's that's a tough pill to swallow, man. Tough pill. Yeah, it's um, while I've mentioned this in the past. I don't know if it's been recently, but there's a loose connection to, you know, end of, you know, like kind of approaching, you know, pandemonium, you know, it's, it's the end of the end as we know it, you know, all right, we're on the other side of the apocalypse. We need a team of people that are going to bring back, you know, (laughs) the food, right? You know, so that's a part of what drove me, you know, and I, I say it in jest, you know, I'm not, I'm not a prepper. I'm not like, I don't think the apocalypse is near, but the concept of being able to feed yourself is critically important to me. So I say that as a preamble to, I hope I never have to produce at the level of like a traditional farmer when it comes to volume. Right. You know, I hope I never have to produce at a level like, you know, our grandparents and great grandparents did um, because they they that's the only way they fed themselves. Now, again, I said, I hope I never have to. That's key because, you know, it sounds good if I don't have any of insert this crop. And I could just go to the store to do, to get it if I want, or I could just go without. I could eat something else. But when you think about, you know, the importance of some of these things, it's make or break. Boy, that makes me woozy. Yeah, you know. Well, my gardening experience definitely comes from a prepping background. Um, mm-hmm. I am not a prepper because I have prepped as much as I want to prep. So there is that. Um, I'm sure there's a listener right now that is an active prepper. Um, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I respect it. You know, 
and I've said this before, but I, I do want to go on record probably more often than not saying that my whole goal was to learn how to grow the food. So when I needed to grow it, I could grow it. And, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. starting seeds was the next evolution to that. And that is the benefit of, you know, of starting when I did, because I can remember, I can actually remember sitting on the opposite side of this room on this podcast with you saying how somebody during the pandemic was selling one day old tomato seedlings mm-hmm. for 25 mm-hmm. cents. And it disgusted me because of setting up people for failure. And mm-hmm. I mean, does that disgust me in a sense? It's like, yeah, because it was just ignorance feeding ignorance at this point, but it, you know, you can't fault somebody because they were trying to do something, but that was the moment. And then they were like, Oh crap, I have to do something. But yeah. because we're sitting in these seats and we're having these conversations and the viewers and listeners are watching and learning, they're already light years ahead of that, you know? And, um, when you, we, we, Starting seeds, you know, clearly we've been doing a quote unquote series about it. It's a lot cheaper, more freeing, and it's, I mean, exhilarating is not really the word I would necessarily use, but satisfying. It, it definitely, to me, it gets to where I get excited about it because, you know, it's like I was doing a video and I was like, every single thing you see in my garden, I started from seed. And we've got Brussels sprout plants that are two and a half feet tall. And I started mm-hmm, those by mm-hmm. seed months ago, you know, mm-hmm. and it's it's exciting to be a part of that. And it's yeah. exciting to when you do the cost analysis of what your garden is producing and all that, that you're coming out ahead because you've done that. But mm-hmm. when you start the seeds, there's the room to just screw it up royally. And um, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made and that you will make, no matter even if you're an expert, you will still make mistakes. But it's identifying the mistake and being able to correct it that I think is really, really important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's the rebound, right? Uh, just a quick note um, from, you know, Batavia, not the sponsors. There is, again, while I'm not a prepper, where I'm not thinking that there's going to be a, you know, an apocalypse in my lifetime, there is still that piece of, you know, for the last handful of years, the reason why I've expanded to grow things, some things that I don't even eat a lot of, but, you know, they've proven to be a bit more difficult uh, to, um, to like grow, right? Yeah. You know, it's the, I need the at bats. And you, like you said, you get those once a year it's a once a season that you're getting those at bats potatoes is a really good example off topic from starting seeds but maybe you know maybe something to consider anywho um it's because i don't want to have to try to figure this out from step zero if i need need to grow it that's why I'm growing like shelling um beans are on my longer list you know work through if you're gonna have trouble with those you know, you're, you're a little you're, bit You're loopy. triggering me today because yeah, yeah. I have a, a, a bag full of black eyed peas that I have mm-hmm. not shelled yet. Yeah, and I've been uh, looking yeah. at them like, I need to shell them, I need to shell them, and I still haven't shelled them. And I'm like, damn, she's even in my head telling me to shell them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think that, um, so, so yeah, so that's that kind of clarification around, you know, the prepper and yeah. all of that stuff. To, focus back on the starting seeds and you know the mistakes in particular and how I feel like it could have some level of domino effect if you don't get your hands around it or kind of close the door on what the mistake is and move on is these are the kind of the first steps that most of us are taking at the beginning of our garden season whenever that is for you yeah right people that grow more like all year long they may have a different time frame or a different kind of activity that initiates it you know but generally speaking if you're looking at entering a new garden year and you're growing things from seed starting seeds is going to be the beginning right and we know kind of what happens when if you start out strong you know just even mentally you have a better chance at finishing strong right you know even though you stumble at the beginning, if you, you run into some roadblocks, doesn't mean that it's going to be a flop, but let's try to get our hands around it. And we shall do this in three, two, one. Go for it, buddy. Yeah. And, you know, I do want to start at the very, very beginning of seed starting, but I also, I want to say this to when you start seeds, 
you basically take your garden season and in the coldest of places that listen to us, we've, we've got the analytics on it. There's people that can only garden outside for like three or four months. They're now gardening because they're starting seasons, consider gardening six Mm -hmm. to seven months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it's a year round endeavor. It never, Mm -hmm. ever stops. It's just, you know, it sounds kind of dramatic, but it doesn't stop. And I mean, you you know, you want to get started on the right foot. And I think the first place for us to start is the soil, Mm -hmm. Um, the dirt, the seed starting substrate, the mix, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think we really need to start there. And I'm going to go on a limb and say, whatever you do, don't use potting soil. Mm-hmm. Done. And I'm going to contest that. So uh, of for the factual actuals, um, and I, be- I personally believe, you may differ as in the audience, but I personally believe with things like this, the frequency and the quantity are important. So when I talk about at-bats, um, I probably guess... Ben has been starting seeds and we're primarily talking about indoors twice as long as I have and easily is not twice as long three times as long how right. long have you been starting not, seeds three years no uh, this is the fifth, fifth year. year okay yeah. um like two and a half yeah so like you know one approach there would be just to nod and keep on moving yeah. you know? like, <laughs> let me give you the, the thing I'm giving you here kudos. versus no. you know? <laughs> 2.4 per yeah so um and you know easily you know double or triple the amount especially with your ramp up in these last handful of years and so i respect that you know but my experience is my experience right. so this is actually a good segue when it comes to potting soil um i think that the pros may not outweigh the cons so there is that balance and i don't use potting soil exclusively um potting soil generally is going to be more expensive than most things you'd use for seed starting. Um, That's my thought. I think that uh, there may be a little bit more work to sift out the good stuff that's in potting soil for the purpose that it's intended for, but that creates, you know, um, some uh, issues potentially with seed starting, you know, so things like the organic matter, wood chips here and there, you don't want that stuff when you're starting seeds in these little bitty things indoors, right? right? So that's a con of sorts, right? You pick that stuff out, filter that stuff out, whatever have you. Um, But I do think that potting soil is probably the richest compared to making your own potting soil. It's more consistent, Um, excuse me, making your own seed starting soil. And I think it's for sure richer than your purchase seed starting mix. So based on those balances, things I've done over the last handful of years is I may not start with it, but I'll definitely transition to it when I pot up. Well, and I mean, you're talking about two totally different things now. So we're talking very beginning, minute one, seed in, you open a bag, you grab a handful of potting soil and you throw it in. Big no, no. Sifting it is a totally different story. That's something that is, you know, if you sift it fine enough and you get those big particulate matters out, then yeah, you can use it. And it is, I've done both. First of all, when I took a handful and just stuck it in, it was the worst thing ever. It just, over the years and, and watching how things have grown, it was the worst results I've ever had. If something grew because, you know, you had a big stick in there, you had a big piece mm-hmm. of bark or something. Um, I did a year where I sifted it, man, it was some work, but I sifted it and it did work and it was, it was pretty fluffy, but you know, over the years trying different methods and, you know, kind of honing it a little bit more, the potting soil uh, as a whole, other than um, some of the actual seed starting mixes, I don't like either though. I will say that, have you know, like, um, I think that like your Jiffy mix is better than your potting soil for me because it's fluffier. It's more fine. It's basically ready to go. Even though I don't really like it, I think it is good to use. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So, you know, what I was talking about when it comes to using potting soil for, as a seed start, I was going over the, the cons, right? right? And because you really would need to sift it or be very, you know, eagle eye on pulling out the bigger pieces. That's the reason why it's a con for yeah. me. You know, um, so I definitely we're on the same page there, even though you're fighting it. (laughs) I don't want to be on the same page as you, but I don't like that there's fertilizer already in it either. 
I don't like mm-hmm, that aspect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that also, this is where uh, there's a bit of this. It's still new year, new me. So like some of these things just, just kind of spark things in my head the same way that it does you. And I kind of get a little bit excited about it. This is the difference in gardeners. Your view on fertilizer and your approach to fertilizer is different than mine. We're not digging into that. No, Leonard. He likes to take us off track. I think he likes to see us kind of bounce around in topics. Um, And so because of that, I think it influences what you just said. And the reason why I don't look at it in that same way. I actually like the idea that, you know, most potting um, soil that you'll buy or potting mix, I look at them as the same thing. Um, It'll say something like feed up to three months. Yeah. Please don't contest the idea that I say that they're the same thing. You know, it feeds up to three months. Right. You know, and so I'm like, all right. I got some time here, right? Save me a step. Um, and I think you also fold in, you know, my experience level, the consistency over the years. Like I want to cut out some steps if I can, you know, the confidence level, all of that is mixed into why I want to do a certain thing the way I want to do a certain thing, you know? Right. Now the best, the best I've had, and I'm using it right now is, and I hate to admit it is um, pro mix. It's, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. always fluffy. There's very minimal stuff in it. It doesn't have any fertilizer. And the reason why I, I like is because I like to have total control over that, over my seedlings, because I am a believer in like feeding at the right time. And I don't want to overfeed and push growth too fast to cause die off because that mm-hmm. can't happen. You know, you start feeding and, um, you know, so having it built into your soil is, you know, I had a question on YouTube recently. Somebody's like, hey, do, should I mix my fertilizer into my potting mix? And I just instantly was like, I, you know, I don't like that because when the seedling is growing, there is a point in which it doesn't need a lot of food. It just needs to kind of get its roots going and it's got mm-hmm. enough to do that. But you, you know, you learn more about the stages or I have as far as like when to feed, when not to feed this, that and the other, because by, con- by doing it, I can control how fast things grow. You know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I can, you know, if I'm like, hey, the weather's bad because, you know, it, this isn't like like we do these on a schedule, but then there's like leeways in the schedule based on weather outside. And if you're predicted to get like a crazy freeze, like, you know, my big plan out dates February 15th, roughly for a lot of my cool weather crops. But if February 15th comes and it's going to be 30 degrees during the day, like I'm not going to start hardening them off or planning them out. I'm going to wait. Mm -hmm. And I need to be able to buy myself that time. And luckily we have technology where we can look at the forecast, stuff like that. So, um, you know, making your own soil is good. If, you know, it's really forgiving. I've done it before. There's an episode previously where I gave the recipe for it. Um, And it's just really time consuming and labor intensive to do so. So I didn't like doing that. And then I left my peat moss outside and it just got wet and turned to a big brick. So, I kind of backed off from that completely, but as yeah, far, I mean, I think, go ahead. No, no. Well, I, I was going to say as far as like making soil and buying soil, I think it's, is if you're doing like a seed starting mix, it's up to how much work you want to put into it. And f- sifting is a lot of work. I'll just leave it at that. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the, and I want to, I want to kind of move on to the next item. I don't want to spend so much time here, yeah. although this is really critically important. I think these things are relative when it comes to, um, you know, the considerations, because how many plants are you starting? How many seeds are you sowing? Right. You know, or uh, how many seedlings do you plan on starting? Um you know, it's the creeping cost. Yeah. Right. We know that the kind of probably from most to least expensive it's probably seed starting mix is the most expensive when you're buying it potting soil slash spotting you know mix is probably less expensive based on the volume right and then um making it yourself is the cheapest right you know but we were talking i think two years ago and i have a short on youtube under be better garden um 
there's a lot more there for you to see. I don't know that it's worth searching me out for that <laughs> this one video, but I'm like, it's like January or February. And I'm like, I have on full on boots, you know, I have a coat on, a sweater, like, you know, it's the dead of winter and I'm outside trying to mix this stuff up. Yeah. You know, that's just inconvenient, you know, and all of those things matter. And so actually, interestingly enough, I have a couple of different brands of seed starting mix that I purchased this year to do some loose comparisons. Right. This is not some elaborate, you know, experiment or anything, you know, but I kind of want to balance. Obviously, I clearly know what the price of these the cost of these things are um, compared to the thing that I'm making you know Um, I also believe for me it depends on the things that I'm growing too because some things will are starting like you know in dust you know some things you know need a bit more care when it comes to it so um, but I can't agree with you more on you have to figure out what makes most sense for you when it comes to a seed starting medium right now, I mean, once you get out of the soil, you go right into the water. Um, and that's really important from the time you put the seed in to the mix until the time that it comes out and goes outside. It's all about your watering. Um, you know, one thing I did wrong in the very beginning is I would put my seed starting mix in and then I'd put my seed in and I'd water but I would never be able to get enough water because, you know, sometimes that stuff, especially if you're using like a seed starting mix, not just like a potting soil, it could mm-hmm. dry and you've got to really saturate it. And the seed would move around. It would get like excessively buried. You know, it's just it was turning to be a real nightmare. Um, so the one thing that I started doing is I pre-wet my soil. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I put it in the cell. I water it and then I water it again and then I water it again. And once I feel like it's nice and saturated, that's when I'll do it. Yeah. And I'm generally still, um, there's a dampness, like just a slight dampness to the touch. Um, and this is for, again, indoors. So do something a little bit different when I'm outdoors and, and using, you know, various um, soil makeup. But I basically do the full on water, watering, basically putting my seed cells into, you know, the tray and it has water in the bottom and I let it absorb the water. Um, and that's because I prefer not to work with that really wet soil or, you know, kind of saturated soil when I'm sowing seeds um, because I will easily get distracted, put the wrong seed where it's easier for me to kind of track what I've done when things are dry. Again, personal preference. Now, I don't I I'm going to go on the record and say I don't believe what I'm about to say next is because of what I just said, because again, you have two different gardeners that, with the exception of brassicas, have had success with starting seeds. You know? um, but the next thing I'm going to say is, and it's in every plant forum, like house plant forum, you know, tropical plants, every really garden forum. Hey, what's wrong with this thing? And you're going to get a percentage of people that say you're over watering it, a percentage of people that say you're underwatering it. And it drives me crazy, but I'm going to say that. <laughs> One of the things I've seen as far as struggles is I've either over or underwatered, you know, yeah. things are sitting in my seed trays, you know, <laughs> you know, and so there's sign, telltale signs of, you know, that when it comes to really both over or underwatering it. I've seen, I've, I've watched you and I think you have, um, you've developed a real knack for really that line between, you know, I'm giving it what I believe is enough water, but definitely not too much. Right. Um, Because of the other side of it is, you know, you, it could kill a plant, especially of that size. If you're not, if it's too dry, Yeah. you know, so. Well, and I mean, you you don't have a lot of forgiveness time and the Mm -hmm. way I look at it too, when I'm watering in the beginning. So generally speaking, I start two 72 cell trays of seeds at once. Um, But even if I was using like six packs, let's say I was just doing, you know, two trays of those, which is 72 cells, I would use about a half a gallon of water on them before I put the seed in. And then once I get the seed in the soil and it's all done, then I rewater with about another half a gallon. So I'm using about a gallon each time I do it. But the trick is just to kind of, you know, wave it over it, not let it hit it hard. And once I started pre- 
watering my soil, I have noticed, and I haven't really put it together until recently, that my succession in, or yeah, my successful germination rate has really gone up a lot over the years. Um, and th- the reason why is you, you start getting over and under watering. I don't water my seedlings again until after they've come up. And it's a, probably about a week after they've germinated. Generally, I don't water them again. And from the time that like I had, I just had my cabbages in, I watered them four times in six weeks mm-hmm. before I put them out roughly. Um, and I, at the very end, it was getting to where I needed to water like every other day. Like I, once I saw like I watered them and then I was like, oh, I've got to water them again. Like I knew that they were starting to fill. But, you know, you've got to think about what's in how much volume is in that seed cell, how much roots are in there. Mm-hmm. And that's going to mm-hmm. tell you how much it is. But you know what? Also, once I started doing that. I don't have fungus gnats anymore. I've not had a fungus gnat yet. And I think that's got, it's either got to do with that or my soil starting mix. One of the two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, um, you know, I, <laughs> every year I'll have some type of uh, fungus gnats, but it could be house plants or otherwise. Um, and it's not as bad as I thought it would be with my, where I'm starting my seeds uh, for the garden. Um, I told you I've had more issues with um, aphids and I know that that tracks back, not with me necessarily reusing the containers, but it's the soil in a seed starting soil that I'm using. And it could be any version of what I described that I use, right? You know, when you think about kind of the, um, the, um, the compost that I made when I'm making my own, that I'm going to add to it, you know, where that's been all year, but that's a different conversation. Um, I think that, um, especially if you're starting out, the look of the plant on top can be very misleading to how much growth there is from a root perspective. I think that, go ahead. I know you. To an extent, there comes a time when it will match, but yeah, you're, you're exactly right to an extent. And then once you get the, you'll, you'll see it, but I've seen the same thing where it's like, this plant's growing good. And then you pull up and you're like, wait, there's, there's no roots or they're rotted or something. So yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. I wouldn't have paused to let you jump in if I knew you were going to disagree with me. <laughs> that was the face of like, absolutely. <laughs> so what, what I, it, I don't necessarily mean like from a health perspective, but it's a really good add on. Um, I mean, like, you know, you have four or five or six leaves and you kind of feel like, all right, it's steady underneath yeah. and you look and it's, it's not quite yet, right. you know? So that actually folds into my next thought around very similar when we're talking about being outside no matter what you're growing in containers in ground you know um, 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 raised beds that top layer of soil when you're inside with your seed starts don't tell the whole story no now it's a little bit diff- more difficult than when you're outside because again what she said the volume that you're going to have We aren't starting seeds in like, you know, 10 inches of soil. That's not what we're doing. Uh, So there is a dance and a balance. And you and I have talked about this before. Sometimes I think you may even forget it because you've been doing it for so long and you've, you know, you're so past kind of understanding what that balance is. You're already dancing with the stars, baby. Yeah. Oh, so corny. I mean, I'm looking at cabbage plants right now that are wilting and dying because I forgot to water them. You know, well, Mm -hmm. I didn't forget, but it's... Probably what's going on as I look at them is the the plant was too big for the root. And so like at this point, but see now it's like late stage. Like I'm talking about taking these outside. So this is the point when I can start to see there may be an issue. But yeah, no, you're, I mean, you're right. And the thing is, is if you keep your plants too wet, you're going to rot the roots. That's like the first mm-hmm. and foremost, you're going to rot the roots. And mm-hmm. it's really hard to take a seedling and come back from rotting roots. It's it's not mm-hmm. easy to do. Um, I mean, it's possible, but you're going to set the plant so far back, it's probably not going to be worth your while on that part. Mm-hmm. And so the biggest thing I can say is just err on the side of caution and um, run them a little bit dry. You know, it's, it's good for them to be a little bit dry. Um, it's a lot better than being totally saturated, but watering in anything plants is huge. And it, it's, it's tied directly to your seed starting mix as well uh, as you know, how much soil uh, water retention is in there, stuff mm-hmm. like that. That makes a big difference. Uh, so just be careful of that in the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that um, all of these things are easier when you have one crop you're, you know, you're starting seeds for. But a lot of us just don't have, it's just not like we're going to put some tomatoes under lights and that's it, you know? And so we may, everyone may not have 40 different types of crops over the course of it. Right. But once you start the very beginning of the seed starting for you for that year, it's always much easier for me than once you start to fold in and you're, you're overlapping with seasons and all, you have things that are growing at different paces, you know, that's when, um, that's when I'm, I'm going to hold my bonus one. Um, that's when kind of how you pay attention to it yeah. becomes critically important. And so I know you're going in a, to a particular order, so I'll let you. Well, and I'll was, let you have it. I was. I'm just. I keep looking over when you're talking because I'm looking at my seedlings. Mm-hmm. Um, the next one would be lights, um, light, not necessarily lights. And I'm going to say something. And it's going to be somebody that's going to contest it. And that's quite all right. I respect that. But window light is not good light, generally speaking. It's just not enough. Unless you're like growing a plant in a corner where the wind, the windows get majority of the day of sun. It's just not enough. Um, you know, I did that for a long time and I just struggled and struggled. Mm-hmm. And when I finally added artificial light, that's when I unlocked the key to seed starting. That was it. And I didn't, I've never ever used multi hundred dollar light setup ever. Um, we have, and so in the link below in the Amazon link, there's all of this stuff that we use for this. And you can see exactly what the stuff that we've used, the lights that I use are in there. Unfortunately, they went up with inflation recently, so they are a little bit more expensive, mm-hmm. but they're not super high powered and they work just fine. I've produced thousands of seedlings with them and will probably produce thousands more with them. Um, now, especially with LED technology, it's totally different. Mm-hmm. But um, this will tie into the next one as well. Um, but the key with lights is keep them close keep them close to your plants. And you're like, well, how close Ben? I mean, close. Like I don't move my lights up until the plants are growing into the light and touching the yep. light. And then I raise them up and then I raise them up, you know, as they keep doing that. So it takes a while to keep that going and giving them, you know, you can't run artificial light like the sun. You can't do mm-hmm. eight hours at a time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's straight up 18 hours on six hours off. Mm-hmm. nothing in between i do 16 and 8 yeah so and to be quite frank i read that online somewhere like from a trusted source and i set my timers and the most difficult thing for me was starting seeds is actually the timers that i set like i am googling every year oh, how do i <laughs> it's embarrassing i'm so bad at it you, know? it's like, you should try 18 and 6 and what yeah. You, I mean, the thing is, is you speed up that growth a little bit, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, what we're trying to do is we're matching, we're, tr- we're attempting to match the sun and you're, you're just, you mm-hmm. can't do it. Mm-hmm. The power of the sun mm-hmm. is just unbelievable, but 18 hours on six hours off, basically the way that functions is around the day cycle. So when the plant goes outside, it's going to get light of some sort, whether it's in the shade or not, it's still getting light Mm -hmm. for that amount of time. So it's getting it used to that. And it's something that I've stuck with. um, Trying to think how it hasn't been from the beginning of using artificial. I started off doing 12 and 12 and Mm -hmm. I was just getting bad results. Um, A lot of leggy seedlings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But when I started adding more longer light, closer my seedlings were more stocky and they were more strong the stems were stronger yeah because they didn't have to do anything to reach that light and that's something because you know if they lean or anything like that then you know um like for instance on my seed shelf i'm looking right now my lights like on the very ends of each tray 
they kind of get a little bit less. So all of the the first and the last row, they all kind of lean in a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I'll mm-hmm. rotate them periodically and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. as those lights lift up and that light can spread and that plant gets stronger, I lose that aspect. So running those lights is really, really important. And I'm a firm believer in that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Agreed. I think that... Um, you know, the place where I start the most of my seeds has very little sunlight, um, but I know how that works. I know, you know, it's so different than what your house plants are going to do and need. Yeah. Like I have house plants that are sitting in my front window um, in my living room. And generally speaking, most of them do just fine. Mm-hmm. But this is not that. You know, and so um, I've absolutely I've seen online people posting pictures of super leggy plants that are sitting on a windowsill. Yeah. Now, maybe there are a couple of things that will do okay, you know, just okay once you get them outside. But most things are going to struggle because of that. Um, and so I don't necessarily measure it out, but I, I'll say like maybe a finger between, watch Young Ben disagrees, between the light and the p- top of the plant, maybe a finger's distance, you know, so it's not touching it like as a normal thing, but you have kind of that kind of gap. No, and I have yeah. pretty thick fingers, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I don't really, I'm looking at mine now. So when mine start, because of the trays I use, they're bigger, there was more of a gap, but they don't mm-hmm. have to get moved up for a long time. But once they mm-hmm. move up, I, I'm about the same way. Mm-hmm. It They get to a point, especially once I start adding fertilizer where they really start to grow mm-hmm. and I just can't keep up with it. It's like, I mean, yeah. sometimes, you know, especially with tomatoes, it's like every day I'm like raising the lights. Um, but, you know, if you don't get your light going in the right direction, it's tough. And I've seen people like high powered LEDs that have like, five feet above and they're still burning their plants and i'm like what are you doing you know like (laughs) you don't you're you're not growing you know pot you're you're growing regular plants like keep that light close keep it down on it and i i think you're exactly right just as close as you can and if you start to see burning on the leaves and stuff then raise it a little bit but Mm -hmm. generally speaking the average low clock low cost grow light is not going to be enough power to burn your plants Mm -hmm. generally speaking Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know that i've ever had um plants burned do you think that the lights are strong enough to dry out the soil like um quicker if that makes sense yes that goes into the next one Mm -hmm. so um heat heat goes into the next one um Mm -hmm. Not enough heat and not and underestimating the amount of heat. So, um, you know, when I start my seeds, I cover them at first, you know, mm-hmm. I, a humidity dome of some sort. You can use plastic wrap. I have actual plastic domes that I bought that just go on top of my trays. And between the lights, even though they're LEDs and they're low heat, they still create heat. Mm-hmm. And you can see that they sweat in there, which is what I want. I want to create humidity. Um, and this is without adding bottom heat. So they do create some heat to them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the high powered lights, they will create more heat. I've used CFL bulbs in the past. They work good. But um, you know, knowing when to and not to add heat is important. Not every seedling needs a heat mat. That's really important to understand. We don't need to add heat to every seedling. So once we know that, then we can start deducing when to add heat and when not to add heat. And ambient temperature in your house definitely comes into play here. So if you keep your house warmer, then, you know, generally speaking, you're not going to keep your house so warm that plants won't germinate, but you can keep your house so cool that it will hinder them from germination. So you want to keep it right in that that happy Goldilocks zone, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, like I said, average heat. You know, if you're running your house at 85 degrees, which I know somebody who does, you're going to have a hard time growing brassicas. Mm -hmm. But if you're keeping it in in the low 70s, upper 60s, something like that in the wintertime, you're going to be, you know, just fine for your brassicas and stuff like that. Once you start getting your summer plants, we need to add bottom heat. Mm -hmm. I've grown... um 
hundreds of summer plants without bottom heat. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is kind of the nice and the niceties, right? You know, so I used seed starting trays last year, seed starting trays, uh, uh, heat maps, heat maps, heat mats, mats, (laughs) M-A-T-S, last year and uh, for my summer crops. And I didn't pay close enough attention to say, all right, oh, they germinated faster, you know, and I'll probably do again, completely um, unofficial, you know, kind of monitoring of it um, because that also is a way to, again, dry out your soil. So you need to be careful around mm-hmm. like, you know, how long they're staying on that heat mat when it's time to take them off of that heat mat. Um, I think for me, and this is the, when you mentioned like the different temperatures in someone's home, none of our setups are going to be the same. No. You know, none of the environments, I should say, are going to be the same when it comes to starting these. So some things need to be tweaked a little bit here versus well, there. We've talked about this with your basement a few times. Mm-hmm, your basement mm-hmm. is significantly warmer. And in most people's basements. Yeah. And know, I've, period. I've started seeds. I started seeds without a heat map for years and mm-hmm, years. Mm-hmm. And the only seed that it really, really seems to make a difference for is pepper seeds. That's the only one. And I think what I was having before is they would just... Because I keep my house cool, it, and when I say cool, average about 63 degrees in the wintertime. And that's cool in my mind. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. I mean, we, I basically told my wife, like, you can either have a bunch of blankets because she loves blankets, or we can run heat and not have blankets. And she said, I want yeah. blankets. I said, okay. So we did that. And um, I think what was happening was it just wasn't warm enough, and the seeds were actually starting to rot in the soil. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that... It's just something that added to me. Now, when I added the bottom heat, I will say that I do get faster germination, but I don't think it's 100% necessary, Mm -hmm. but it is important. But I also have done it on my, like, um, brassicas and stuff, and I had bad germination Mm -hmm. because it was too hot. Now, the difference is I don't use super high-end heat mats with thermostats in them, and I never Mm, will use that because I don't want to pay the cost for it. I mean, that's just all there is to it, you know? Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. um, you know, with that being said, I don't know exactly. And I mean, I could get a soil thermometer and all that stuff, but I'm not interested in doing that is how much heat is being applied to it. But I know that some of these plants do like it. So I use it when it's appropriate. Yeah. I mean, I think these are all things that on well, the first parts are like kind of the critical piece critical pieces now we're getting into a little bit more of the you're tweaking your process and if you're i if you're seeing some of these things we're talking about like this is the problem and if you can get ahead of it great because again we're still talking about a short window even for the longest growing season yeah you know yeah and i mean you know as far as heat goes the one aspect that it does do and it it goes in combination with the lights is it can actually dry out your soil Mm-hmm. And cause, you know, cause you to have to water more. So just keep an eye on that. But what it really comes down to is it's all about having a good plan. And that comes, at, you know, planning out when things go in the garden and how much you're going to do. Because you don't want to start 50 seeds if you're going to only need to do 10. So mm-hmm. doing all these things really is is useful. And the planter app is good for that. So um, it's a sponsor of the show. There's a link below to get you a discount, a, a nice discount for a lifetime subscription, and it'll help you plan your garden. It'll help you with your seed starting times. It'll help you with all that stuff and keep you well organized. So definitely check that out so that you can use it moving forward to help you because this is why we talk about it all the time and we use it is because it does help with that and it does help you make the right plan for the future and keep you going in the right direction for the amount that you need. So um, Mm -hmm. with its simple drag and drop interface and all the plant data on there, it's almost a no brainer to get it. So definitely check that out. But having a plan is something that we talk about a lot. And the the reason why is because it's so important. I mean, have you ever Batavia just willy nilly started seeds and just been like, I got way too many. I neglected them. I couldn't take care of them, something like that. I mean, yeah, I think that so generally, yes. Right. You know, so I err on the side of almost everything with going with more. 
right? You know? yeah. So that's there's no different uh no difference when it comes to, you know, my seeds starting. So even when I was only planning on planting, you know, three or four different types of tomatoes, you know, I had forty what well, <laughs> I can't remember the number. I had 40 seed starts or 50 or 60 seed starts. It was something obnoxious for my area. I can remember this was a couple of years back. I was giving away trays of seedlings. Yeah. You know, because I had already planted out my garden. I had all of these extras. You know, I mean, again, that's that's a, a thing. Tomatoes and I have a thing, you know. Yeah, so there's you, that. you guys have a love but relationship. But generally speaking, it's the, you know, I'm not sure if I really want to grow, but I'm going to go ahead and, and start it. Like, that's not a good plan. No. Right? That's not the best use of your resources. No. And I mean, it's it's a common mistake that should be avoided because, you know, if I wasn't selling seedlings, I wouldn't start anywhere near the amount that I do. Mm-hmm. But I'm able to have and I would always start a little bit extra because you never know when you're going to. I mean, I'm looking at a six pack right now. It's got two dead plants in it, you know, mm-hmm. so I've got four left. Well, if I needed to have, you know, a certain amount. I can go a little bit over and it's not the end of the world, but you don't want to have so much going that you neglect. That's mm-hmm. really important. Neglect is a, a real issue, I think. And it it's easy at first, but the bigger they get, the harder it gets to take care of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, so this is where all of this timing kind of comes out together. So the more that you have, I mean, these seedlings especially if at the beginning you're doing for you know you're starting for spring and summer they're not all going out at the same time they're not all going out at the same time so not only are you managing their indoor needs now you're managing the idea of when are these things going out you know outside you know the hardening off process like all of that is a part of what you're managing as a gardener and the more you have the more there is to manage yeah. you know i mean it's it's kind of plainly put there and one other thing, too, to add into all of this, I, I did forget this. Um, well, there's a couple more, but this one is um, airflow. So you definitely want to have some airflow over your seedlings. And that's as simple as adding a fan. Um, you know, chip, cheap clip-on fan on the side of your shelf, a stand-up fan, you know, a ceiling fan at minimum, something to keep movement to strengthen those stems to go outside. Um, helps keep the fungus gnats down if you have issues with that, which you should probably lower your watering if you have that. Um, but that really does make a difference. It's that gentle movement and flow that will really strengthen your seedling. And I've had plants before I started adding them, they would look really good inside. And I'd plant, especially like tomato plants, anything that gets tall, and mm-hmm. I'd put them outside and they would just like instantly flop over. Mm-hmm. And then guess what would happen? The roly polies would jump on them. Because they were just laying yeah. on the ground. They didn't have time to strengthen up and reach for the sun to straighten themselves back out. So it's kind of one of those things that we want to, you know, take advantage of and use to our ability. And I mean, it is a little bit more of an investment, but it's, you know, I think my fans were like 10 bucks each and it's made all the difference in the world. The only thing that sucks is I did take them apart the other day and clean them. That was a real pain in the butt. Mm-hmm. But how long, how many years ago do you think you bought the current? fans yeah three years mm, girl yeah. my so, seed starting setup is three years old so today's uh yesterday's prices are not the same as today's prices uh so note that um and this is just not to you know create the tension i've the first couple of years i didn't have fans at all and i feel like again with the exception of brassicas my seedlings were successful um and when i say successful i mean they did okay coming out, right? Like the, by the end of the garden season, they were rock stars. Um, but I have stepped up when it comes to that, um, you know, that motion and adding some fans because I believe it's under the good, better, best motto. I think right. that that's best, right? You know, so maybe just under good, like just okay. And maybe even good would be not having any kind of flow, you know, better would be like a regular, um, you know, like a stand up fan, you know, um, yeah. oscillating fan or something. I've done that. Um, and just being careful about how strong that is, you know, the, the amount of air that you have there. But when it comes to, this is something that you're again, year over year investing in it. I think it's a, an important investment. Um, but this goes back to kind of the 
you know, the creeping pricing, you know, that, you know, this thing starts to become more and more expensive. I didn't buy all of these things in year one. You know, I just got heat mats last year. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, And so, so I think that, you know, just you, you can, you, you know, your budget better than we will ever. Right. We don't, want to know <laughs> but your success rate goes up when you do this stuff because you're eliminating different issues and you know it, it's hard to because like for instance here in the spring when i plant out we can get high winds mm-hmm. and when i put a, a seedling out that hasn't been used to that it can get beat up and then kind of just set it back and I, I wanted to avoid that and I did for a long time without it but I noticed real quickly that I had stronger ceilings and on the flip side I mean you can always take your hand every so often like a couple times during the day and just a lot of times when I talk about my seedlings on videos and stuff I'll rub my mm-hmm. hands over it mm-hmm. consistently and that's what that does that's just strengthening those seedlings so you just yeah. do it more and more and more I think that when we talk about things that are maybe nice to have and maybe, um, you know, that you don't absolutely need, I think you're also the thing that we're not saying out loud is like, oh, I've had success and I didn't do that. And it could have been that year had just more um, prime conditions, you know, more ideal conditions otherwise. Right. You know, so Chicago is the windy city, but summers, you know, springs and well, springs probably are, but summers definitely aren't like the windiest. Right. You know, so again, you know, my practice for hardening things off, you know, it could be that I'm hardening things off longer than I would if I would need to, if I had, you know, airflow while they were inside you know so it's again you'll fine tune this on your own i think that if you can fit it into your budget absolutely do it the fans are 15 dollars. okay so i think absolutely do it um if you can fit it into your budget yeah i don't i'm not recommending against it well the whole thing about it too is when we talk about this stuff it's um it's adding it you can build this seed shelf Mm -hmm. out piece by piece by piece Mm -hmm. and each time you add something like this, you're helping with eliminating an issue somewhere, somehow. You know, you're not mm-hmm. necessarily going to change it 100% and make it totally better, but you upgrade your lights, you upgrade your shelf or whatever. You know, you're adding your water, you're adding all these things in each category. You're stepping up your game in a certain way, and it really does help a lot. So, um, I think that's worth talking about in that aspect of it. And mm-hmm. it's, I agree with you. You don't have to just say, okay, I'm going to start seeds. Let me get every single thing I need. I think, you know, instead of having three fans, one on each shelf, you can just do one. You can run your hands over it all the time, but adding that movement in is, I mean, taking them in and moving the seed container back and forth, you know, just shaking it can help with that as well. I mm-hmm. like this because it's a constant movement and it helps yeah. to keep it away. You know what I mean? And it just, it's yeah. more automated, I think is the right Are your look fans at it. on all the time your lights are on? Yeah. They're all mm-hmm. hooked up to the timer. So I have it, um, I have a power strip hooked into the timer. So when the light's on, the fan's on. So again, with the 18 hours, you're getting a majority of the time. And it kind of mimics the outside because, mm-hmm. at, you know, at night, a lot of times outside it gets real calm and mm-hmm. quiet. So yeah. it kind of gives it a break. But um, it seems to help. And it, I think what it's done, too, is it's helped me with my overwatering as well mm-hmm. because it's drying it out a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. So I think it does yeah. help. I um, That's my current setup as well. They're all linked in. So yeah. if the lights are on, the fans are on. And it's a faint. These smaller fans that are in the Amazon store in the link below, they, it's so much of a more of a faint you know, um, amount of, of wind yeah. or airflow than you, again, you would have for a regular fan that's going to cool off a whole room. You know, yeah, <laughs> like it's I mean, the same, you know, it wouldn't be good. And now what I do is I start them on low and then as the plants get bigger, they're two speeds. I'll mm-hmm. end up putting them on high as they get bigger because mm-hmm. they need more wind. But um, like I said, once I put them outside after doing that, I, I eliminated that flopping over, which kind of one thing led to another. It just kind of, you know, snowballed into some other issues. Yeah. One thing I should note about kind of my approach to a lot of things, including gardening, I am a fan of starting a thing at a lower key level and then basically saying, all right, 
did this work? Did it work as well as I think it should? Yep. And then kind of uh, making tweaks and modifications. Because what ends up happening, and it's not necessarily with fans, but you could use this as an example. If you start there, you well, fans are probably a bad example of that. But if you start at the place, you don't know if you really need it as much as what you're adding to it now. You know? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. It's just like with like a if you go all the way back to the seed starting mix, you know, um, you start with one thing and you use it and you're like, hey, I want to step up and use like I started with Jiffy and mm-hmm, I started mm-hmm. with the little cubes that you just add water. And mm-hmm. now I'm using the top end pro mix stuff. But it's over time I got to that point. You know, I, yeah. I didn't use that stuff. I mean, this is like the second year I've used it in all these years. For a long time, I was sifting soil or making it or doing other things trying to do. But, you know, as I stepped up my game, I was able to do it just like my seed starting shelf. Like a couple of years ago, I said, you know what? I'm going to do more. I want to mm-hmm. step up my game. And so we built this out and now we have it. And it's I mean, it's not complicated, but. There wasn't a huge investment at first. It was, what do I have available? And a lot of people listening to this don't need the size that we are talking about, like I'm talking about. You may be able to say, hey, where's my tabletop I can use? You know, Mm -hmm. what kind of grow light can I get to put on it? This, that, and the other. Um, You know, those are the ways you can step it up. And then eventually you'll get to a point, hopefully, where you're like, I want to do more. I want to start this and that and, you know, I want to start all my seeds and then you'll need to step it up to some extent. You may be able to fit it all on one shelf, but then you can use the rest of the shelf for storage. But yeah, you step things up. I'm low cost entry, gradually upgrade over time. I I agree with you. The one reason why I stepped everything up at once this time was because my whole setup was junk. I just was not happy with it. And I had gotten to a point where I was like, I'm tired of tinkering with it. I want to get it. So it runs. And it's like, cause every time I used it, I had to fix something or do, and this is totally off topic, but I just kind of had to do that, you know? Yeah. I think that, um, you know, it's, this is the balance though, because starting off with the lowest possible cost, like the windowsill is a great example of that. Yeah. You know, you're balancing though, like, you know, some levels of, of disappointment and or, you know, lack of success. I'm trying not to say failure, right? Like you, you may not have the results that you want because you've you've basically given it this year to say, I'm going to do this thing, right? right? Or this season or whatever have you. And if you feel like you have room to do that, kind of air quote, take that chance, so to speak, yeah. then, you know, go for it. There is, um, it's, it's akin to how I originally started growing potatoes in containers with the thought of my raised beds are prime real estate. I'm going to try to grow them in, in containers and if they work really, really well, then I'll continue to do that. They, haven't really worked really really well they've kind of worked so there's that so again it's the i could have had a better yield i believe if you go back to the first year of growing potatoes if i had grown them in raised beds you know i so we could kind of go around that circle when it comes to various things i do want to comment on if you were to put your seed starting setup and approach on a timeline you could also line up the way your garden has changed over time yeah Right. You know, and so one thing basically can drive the other. You know, I can remember um, when I first started, I remember checking my seedlings. They were, um, well, one thing I can not recommend to anybody is ever using those um, moss, those um, compostable containers. (laughs) I remember looking at a seedling as a tomato seedling in one of those containers with potting soil with a chunk of bark sitting on top and the seedling was about eight inches long and laying over the top down on the bottom trying to reach for the sun and i was so happy that i had a seedling going but and it was and it was bone dry bone dry not a not a drop of water in it that i could tell um compacted soil the whole nine I, i remember that clearly and now i can look at it and I look at, you know, what I've got going on now and I'm like, there's no way I would ever do that. But that's how I, but that was my low cost barrier to entry. Mm -hmm, You know, it mm -hmm. was yogurt cups. It was, you know, all these different things in front of a window, just struggling to get it. But that was me saying, Hey, do I want to continue to do this? Is this worth my time? And once I started getting the hang of it 
And the next year, I, I remember I, I used one of the little peat things. I don't know what they're called, the peat pellets. Mm-hmm. And um, had better success. But I remember going and looking at those and they were dry as a damn bone. Yeah. And then the next year I'd use some kind of like actual, I was using a yogurt container with peat moss in it or, you know, Jiffy starter and having a more healthy plant going. And then I remember just each year kind of getting better and better and better results, mm-hmm. pushing to do better and better. And that's where I got to the point to where I got confident in what I was doing and was able to start making these investments yeah. to the point to where I had I had an unheated basement and I had built a wood box and lined it with window insulation, put a light and a space heater in it. And that's how I started. And then mm-hmm. I got to where I am now. So I, I know where you sit with that and it's like, you don't want to put a whole lot into it, but if you want to be successful, these are the ways that, well, first of all, the ways that I do it to ensure that I get more success out of it. And I would say the return of investment is tenfold because I've grown lots of food out of it. And it, it was a hard pill to swallow that first year. And I think I bought my seed, the actual shelf. I want to say it was right during COVID. Yeah, it must have been like at the beginning of COVID and everything was really expensive. Mm -hmm. And I paid an astronomical amount for the shelf. But looking back, it's like, I'm happy I did it because it's made it so much easier for me. And um, the one thing real quick is, you know, feeding your seedlings. Mm -hmm. We need to feed our seedlings. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of people that don't agree with fertilizing. And I respect that. I don't agree with it, but I respect it. But when you have your seedlings, it's got to be fertilized somehow because it just, it really helps you get to that successful level of having a strong plant put in so that when we harden it off, which is the final step and that's the killer. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? You know, I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't feel, uh, as equipped to contest your thought on that on what? Um, because on fertilizing your seedlings i think that a lot of the seed starting mixes don't have enough uh, nutrients in the soil to carry you for eight weeks yeah. 10 weeks so there's something to be said about that um if you're not using seed starting mix there's still the thought of what are you growing and what are those needs like how much nutrients did you create by making up your mix? So there's that. Um, again, potting soil is a little bit different. So, but I also uh, believe that it's hard to pinpoint when you had like remember how I said, oh my peppers are they're so small, so small. I feel pretty confident saying had I had them on a more regular feeding schedule from a fertilizer perspective, they probably would have been uh, there would have been more size to them. Um, I don't know that them having more size is it's an ideal, it's the goal, but was an absolute requirement. So I think I need another couple of years to play around with how much I'm fertilizing and what I'm fertilizing to really say, you know, this is a recommendation. I think generally. It's as for a stronger plant as, you know, I don't, I almost, I almost want to say, I don't know if it's completely necessary but I kind of want to say, because, you know, if you're using potting mix, you're going to have fertilizer mixed into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that potting, I'm looking at a potting soil right now or a seed starting mix. And I believe it's a sterile mix. They, they're they basically sterile with no nutrients in them because like peat moss doesn't have any nutrients in it. Mm-hmm. It may break down over time, but within eight weeks, it doesn't break down enough. Um, because we're not doing anything to do that. So adding a little bit of it and I, I like to use slow release, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, and I don't use a whole lot, you know, but it's just enough to get it. And I can see like, I'll add it and then I'll come back like two, three days later and you can see the growth and you can see the color change in the leaves. It's more specifically the color change. Mm -hmm. And that's when I get, when I get those deep greens and I know that I'm doing something right. Yep. Yep. And then, yeah. So I have two more and we're right at the top of the hour. We've gone over a little bit. So I'm going to quickly say them. Um, the first one is, well, yeah, I'll go with this one. Um, similar to how we encourage you to step out into your garden daily. 
don't sow these seeds and just, you know, walk away. Oh, yeah. Right? Not to return like your attention on them. It doesn't mean that they require daily attention. But if you're in a position to take a look at that area you you have your seedlings at, take a look at it daily, you know, because yeah. especially again, it's so little soil for a lot of these things could look good today and then tomorrow they could be on the struggle bus. So I think that that becomes important. And then the last thing is on timing. And I'll give you a chance to obviously to comment on either of those. Um, a mistake that I've seen with myself and then others is just having seedlings inside longer than they really should be. Yeah. Is it detrimental? You know, not necessarily. Sometimes it can be, but this goes back to your plan, you know, the timing of all of this. Um, and if we kind of look at it, like our end goal is to have the strongest plant possible coming out of, you know, wherever you're starting these seeds, you know, just because it's the biggest and it's been growing for the longest doesn't mean that it's going to be strong, right? You're depriving it of what it really wants every day that it's under lights, but it's just what we have to do to get to the place we want to get to in our garden. That's the only reason why we do it. we're doing it. Yeah. So um, I agree with the first one and the second one, I agree with it. Um, I would just, my take on it is um, it does matter because you don't want a root bound plant going mm-hmm. into the garden. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the reason why I say that is because a root bound plants, when the, the roots start circling the pot and you basically, I mean, we've all pulled out a seedling and been like, Oh, look, it's perfect. The roots are all in a nice little block. But once they start wrapping, it's really hard to get them to unwrap, you know, because mm-hmm. the idea when planting is minimal root disturbance. That's the whole idea when you go to plant out. Um, so the thing is with that is just make sure that you're staying on top of them and don't start your tomatoes five months in advance. You know, don't get excited <laughs> yeah. and don't keep up potting them and, you know, know what's going on inside. Give them a little squeeze, give them a little tug, see what happens. If you pull out a plant and it stays nice and firm and you see nothing but roots, you've probably missed it and you need to really get ready to go outside. But I do think that it hinders the plant growth once it gets outside because the roots are already trained to wrap in circles and they can't spread out. So they're going to continue to wrap and look for nutrients in the same area. And if you do take, let's say you take and you split them up the roots and spread them out, you're breaking off roots at that point, which in a small life cycle is not great because you're setting that plant back. So the idea with with starting seeds inside is that we get them to a nice, healthy size and then we can move them out and really speed up that whole process. Otherwise, you might as well just direct sow them outside. Mm -hmm. And I don't I have never direct sowed a cabbage outside because I don't have the time to do that. There's no grace period for me where I live with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And the last thing is just on the hardening off thing. Just don't throw your seeds in full sun each day. Add a little bit more, take about a week to get them used to it or else you're going to kill them and you can have the most beautiful plants in the world. Strongest thing. You could have had a hurricane blowing on them and they're standing up straight with muscles like Arnold Schwarzenegger And the second you put them out there and you leave them out in the hottest part of the day, they're going to burn up and they're going to die. And I mean, you've just wasted your time. And that's where I went wrong so many times. So many times. You're so extreme when it comes to this. That is a great time to kill seedlings when you're hardening them off. right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. And a lot of times, again, a lot of it goes back to the state of that plant, the health of that plant coming out. Um, so starting there and then it's night and day. It's night and day difference, you know, when it comes to the environment. And you still go back to this. This plant is it's an infant. It's vulnerable. Right. Now, I've had some seedlings. Well, I'm hardening them off that they end up, you know, struggling for one reason or another and they bounce back. But I have a lot more that are just dead, dead. I mean, yeah. that's just the reality of it, you know, so. You know, it's funny. I just saw this thing you sent me about these soil temperatures. Mm-hmm. There is a couple of these that um, they it, depending on where I start them in my house, they may not even germinate. Yeah, there's yeah, it's inter- quite it's interesting. a few of them. So we're looking at best soil temperature for starting seeds. Uh, found this on Farmer's Almanac. And I love that they have a minimum, a maximum temperature. And it's probably for like, I don't know, maybe 
15 different vegetables but then the optimum tips are crazy they range from like 60 to 100 degrees fahrenheit you know uh so i think that that's pretty wild that big range but Um, but but, you know we keep our house at a certain temperature but if i were to mm -hmm. start them in another room that didn't get used like a lot of people may do Mm -hmm. you know and doesn't get a lot of traffic a lot of times it's a darker room or something like i easily could not start a pepper in that room at all or a squash you know, mm-hmm. I could probably pull off a tomato, which it does explains why I've had that luck. Then now that I'm looking at this chart more closely, mm-hmm. why I've had the experience that I've had with some of these like eggplants and cucumbers. Those are all ones that I struggled with before I started adding heat. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you could definitely see, though, the difference in some things that, you know, your minimum temperature is 40 degrees for a celery, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And your minimum temperature for melons is 60 degrees. That's a big swag. Yeah. You know, but that absolutely tells you how these plants differ, you know. Yeah. And And a minimum doesn't mean optimum. There is an optimum Mm -hmm. range. So minimum Mm -hmm. means you're just getting through, you know. Mm -hmm. So there you go, everybody. That is um, basically setting up and mistakes to avoid. And these, like I said, these are all things that both Batavia and I have done or deal with or have dealt with all in the past, present, and will in the future, I'm sure. <laughs> no matter how good your setup is, you are going to have issues. But once you take it down one piece at a time, you will get better at it. And most importantly is you're going to be able to identify the issues. And that's something that we need to do in the future is just make sure we're identifying what's wrong and um, correcting them so you can be more successful. But on that note, everybody, let's continue to learn to grow and grow for change. See ya. Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Thanks for checking out the show. If you like what we're doing and you'd like to support us, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash backyard gardens, or you can be an Apple subscriber. And in both of those, you'll get an extra episode every month. You can also make a one-time PayPal donation with the link below, and you can get all kinds of gardening gear, like t-shirts and mugs and cups from the link below at Teespring. And we have an Amazon store, which has all the products that we use and recommend in our gardens, and it helps support our show. And we also add to this list periodically, so be sure to check it out periodically to see if there's anything that you need for your garden. Everything that you do, including a like and a subscribe and even a review, will help us learn to grow and grow for change. See ya. 